I used to work at a self-storage facility. You'd be shocked at what people hide. Written by The Cold People In my first year of junior college, I picked up a part-time job at the local self-store facility. If you've never been to one, it's basically a cluster of metal storage units arranged in grids where people keep their extra furniture. I manned the front desk in the evenings, often with a female student named Liz. Most nights were lethally boring. Liz and I would sit around doing homework and exchanging stories about our lives, occasionally buzzing a car into the lot or helping a renter with a stuck lock. Our manager came in only once a week and hated working there even more than we did. His name was Stefan, and his Polish accent was so thick we mostly nodded our way through conversations with him. A few times a month, he'd bring his ancient golden retriever, Leo, who loved laying on my shoes while I sat at the desk. Those were my favorite nights at work. Stefan expected me to walk the facility each night, checking for unfastened locks, spills, weird noises and smells, or anything else out of order. He'd always say, You are man. You go. Liz stay. Liz no go in dark. I understood his concern. Every few months, the cops would show up and we'd be forced to open a unit. Invariably, there was a low budget meth lab inside, or otherwise, some kind of redneck pharmacy whose contents would land a man in the clink for a decade. Chemical, Stefan would say. You smell. You call. He was a decent guy, but he didn't like Leo much. The dog belonged to his late wife, and Stefan made it very clear that he'd gotten stuck with him when she died. Leo got most of his affection from us, and we didn't mind one bit. Aside from the rules and babysitting his dog, Stefan rarely bugged me, but he checked with Liz on his way out of the office each night. Maybe you teach me science, he'd joke. Get us both bigger money. He'd obviously thought she was cute, and I couldn't blame him. What Stefan didn't know was that Liz was a shameless kleptomaniac who would sometimes pilfer his office for the master key. After a few drug dens were uncovered on the premises, the cops made a switch to company-issued locks that could be opened on short notice. There was a lot of legal gray area around this, so Stefan never let us use it. But the police ordered that the key remain on site in the event Stefan wasn't around and they needed to get into someone's unit. The job got a lot more interesting the first time Liz showed me the key. On dead nights, when no renters came in for hours, she and I would open a few units and peek inside. Sometimes, we'd make a game of it. We'd read the owner's application, which listed their name, age, and profession. And then, we'd try to guess what kind of crap they'd store in a dump like this. Liz and I worked that building like professional cons. We'd pick a floor and a corridor and try to finish up a couple of units in the 15 minutes that we dared to be away from the desk. The best part was watching Leo snoop around and bark excitedly when he got too riled up. We always let him lead the way. Stefan was none the wiser. More than half of the security cameras in the building were long dead and the other half were almost never recording. Stefan never bothered to replace the old tapes. 90% of the units we cracked had furniture and clothes. We'd call these duds because there was never anything interesting in them. But the others 
and valuable sports memorabilia or collector's items. On principle, I never allowed Liz to take anything, and she came to respect my rule. After all, it would be both our asses if something went missing. In a few months, we'd covered only three floors in the five-story building. We found all sorts of interesting things, both great and terrible. One guy, I'll call him Joe, kept a meticulously arranged gay porn shrine made entirely of cutouts from adult magazines from the 1970s. Perhaps this wasn't so interesting on its own, but the fact that Joe was the arch-conservative reverend of our town's biggest church made it a pretty spicy meatball. On another occasion, we found a mostly empty unit, spare a filthy, sheetless mattress in the center, and an old video camera facing it. Liz had told me about people trying to use storage facilities as a place to sell sex, but just the look of this one made me feel like something else was up. It took days of careful watching, but eventually we'd noticed that the unit's owner, one Mr. Klein, was driving in with a teenage girl crouched in his back seat, and not the kind on the legal side of 18. That was a day we decided to make sure the cameras were on in his corridor. We told Stefan, and he'd said he'd take care of it. The unit was cleared out the next time I came in. One day, Liz called me on my night off. I was surprised to hear from her. We weren't the sort of friends who talked outside of work. Can you come visit me? I don't really want to be alone here right now. The urgency in her voice conjured a thousand dark scenarios in my head. I imagined a male renter cornering her alone in that dim and dingy office. I even thought of Stefan going in for a kiss or something creepy like that. What's going on? Are you alright? I heard the click of a lock. Just get here. I just finished one of my night classes. Self store was on the way home. I'll be there in ten. When I arrived, I found Liz standing in the corner of the office, clutching a coffee mug with both hands like she was about to throw it on the next person she saw. It took her a minute to recognize me through the glass, but then she let me in and explained that she'd gotten so bored she decided to go exploring. Liz, we agreed never to do that alone, I said. That's part of the rule. I put my school sweatshirt around her in a lame attempt to comfort her. I didn't know what else to do. Liz pulled the sweatshirt tighter around herself and then nodded at the key on the desk. I scooped it up and glanced at the computer screen. Unit D16's profile was open. It belonged to a Clara Norback. I looked back to Liz, whose gaze seemed to pierce through the floor. Okay, I said, heading out the door. I'll be right back. I never cracked a unit on the fourth floor. Liz had decided to make a go of it without me. I knew exactly where the unit was because the layout was the same on each level, but this floor was darker. Fewer people rented up here, and some of the overhead lights hadn't had their bulbs replaced in years. A faint but unmistakable odor reached my nose as I made my way down the hall. It was sickly sweet, like the stink of rotting meat. The closer I drew, the stronger it got. When I lifted the sliding metal door into the unit, a wave of stench nearly blasted me off my feet. Before me lay a large wooden table, and behind it, a bookshelf 
turned altar. Dried blood caked the surface of the table and snaked down its legs to the cement floor. A dozen half-burned candles adorned the altar, ceremoniously arranged beneath a painting I couldn't make out. I covered my nose with my shirt and flicked on the light switch, but the bulb had been removed. I used my cell phone to illuminate the room, and suddenly, a few objects glinted and glittered around me. On the table was a cleaver, thick and fit for butchering. Resting on the altar, between the candles, was a particularly cruel-looking boning knife. I approached the painting, and on the way, my shoe squished against a hunk of gore. I yelped as my foot slid away from me, but I caught myself on the altar. Bits of hair-covered meat lay strewn across the floor, and a mass of viscera lay piled up at the far end of the room. I looked up and beheld the painting that now loomed over me. It depicted the shape of a man shrouded in darkness. His hands clasped together before him in prayer, and barely discernible gray eyes yawned from beneath the gobs of black paint that formed his face. Fire rose all around him, and a deep red moon hung in the air behind his head like a sinister halo. The painting stirred some old fear deep inside me, awakening something I hadn't felt since childhood. I was terrified. I turned to leave, and as I did, my phone lit up a giant symbol smeared across the table in blood. A circle with flared streaks rising through its center and curling in the shape of a ram's horns. And then, I saw it. Under the table. Placed below the center of the bloody symbol was a head. Lifeless brown eyes gazed up at me, wide and fixed. The mouth locked open in an eternal scream. It was Stefan's dog, Leo. I could hardly speak when I returned to the front office. Liz's shock had turned to rage, and she demanded we call the police. I tentatively agreed, but changed my mind and grabbed the phone out of her hand after glancing at the computer screen. Something wasn't right with Clara Norback's file. She was paying triple the normal rate. Try another one, Liz said joining me next to the computer. Try one of the units we've cracked already. I pulled Mr. Klein's file, the guy who was filming himself with his student. The rate was triple. Liz and I both came to the realization at the same time. Stefan was cracking units just like we were, except instead of reporting them, he was extorting the renters. He probably didn't even call the cops on Klein after we caught him with the girl. He probably just told them the jig was up. Fucking bastard! Liz exploded. She stormed around the room, cursing and gathering her things as she went. I'm getting the fuck out of here, and I'm calling the cops. She stuck an open hand at me, awaiting the return of her phone. By the heaviness of her breath, I could tell she was a split second away from punching someone, and I was the only person around. Just wait a few days, I implored, dropping the phone into her hand. Just let me take a look at the ones we haven't cracked yet. I bet there's more. And maybe we can finally really nail him. Maybe we can get him locked up for a long time. It took a moment for Liz to calm down, but eventually she agreed 
and headed for the door. I'm done, she said. Explain it to him however you like. Then she disappeared into the night. I spent the next hour cycling through the remaining renter files. The fourth and fifth stories were mostly barren, spare a few rentals here and there, all of which were at Stefan's premium rate. But the thing that piqued my interest was a collection of five units, all in a row, marked off as reserved for facility use. But what kinds of things could possibly be in there? I assumed they were for Stefan's personal stash. That night, I mustered the courage to go poke around a bit more. The memory of Leo prancing around swirled in my mind, colliding with the images of his butchered corpse scattered around the dark room. I felt like puking, but I wanted to get this sick fuck in Leo's name. He was a good dog. One of the units had an obvious marijuana grow up inside. Plastic tarps lined the walls to conceal the smell, and expensive UV lights and fans were meticulously organized around the room. But the grow had been recently harvested, and little, if anything, remained that could be tied to Stefan. I moved on. Another unit was completely empty, aside from a few old paintings leaned in the corner and covered with blankets. Maybe they were stolen, but even if they were priceless Nazi pilfered relics, they probably couldn't be tied to Stefan. I continued my search, but after a while, I gave up and headed straight for the mystery units on the top floor. Only a single light worked in this hall. It hung solemnly in the dark, illuminating only a small cone beneath itself. Just behind it, I could barely make out a group of utility carts, arranged as a blockade to prevent renters from passing. I carefully climbed over them, using my phone as a light. A dozen more steps through the dark took me to the reserved units. These units were different. None of them had locks at all. Spare the one at the very end. The doors to the first four were weighted shut. Impossible to pry open with my scrawny arms. The master key was useless on the fifth unit. Instead of the standard police lock, it had an old, thick combination lock. I tried the address of the facility, the floor and unit number, and even the issued number printed on the back of the lock, but nothing worked. I trudged back to the front office in defeat and closed up for the night. My investigation would have to continue on my next shift. A few days later, Stefan called, offering me a few extra shifts. Apparently, Liz had told him she'd quit, which took the pressure off me to come up with a lie. I texted her and asked how it all went down. What she said made my stomach fold over on itself. Liz had gone into work to grab her last paycheck, but Stefan told her he'd have it in a few days. On her way out, the psycho queen herself, Clara Norback, walked in with a little teacup poodle on a leash. Liz completely lost it and blew up on both of them, screaming that she knew what they were up to and that she was going to the cops. She made good on her threat, but the cops told her they couldn't open the unit without evidence to support her accusation. And in my panic state, I hadn't thought to take any pictures of my phone. They said they'd swing by and talk to Stefan. 
but she told them, "Don't bother." I agreed to the extra shifts, but secretly, I only planned to work enough of them to nail Stefan on something substantial. Liz stopped responding to my text that week. I knew she was beyond livid at my failure to help corroborate her claim. Friday night arrived. As I clocked in, Stefan came down, sweat soaking his gross tank top and glistening on his hairy chest. It looked like he'd been moving a bunch of shit around, probably up to no good. I tried not to make eye contact. The moment he bailed, I began my search. I rifled through his office, looking for any set of numbers he might be dumb enough to use as a passcode for the combination lock. I learned the name of his ex-wife, and searched her on Facebook, found her birth date, and wrote it down. I wrote down more numbers Stefan had scribbled on loose sticky notes. I even wrote down six six six, on the off chance. He fancied himself a devil worshipper like Miss Norback, and then I saw something that made a stone fall in my throat. Minimized on Stefan's computer screen was a scanned copy of Liz's job application. I checked his browser history and found dozens of Google searches on Liz. He was trying to find anything about her: social media, photos, family. This activity was beyond the scope of mere termination of employment. Stefan was obsessed with the girl. I jotted down Liz's birth date and grabbed a dusty flashlight out of the desk. Then I headed to the fifth floor. The corridor is pitch black. My flashlight circle fell on the single lamp that had worked on my last visit. As I passed beneath it, I saw that the bulb had been removed. Further along, the utility cart blockade had been reinforced. Now, a bulwark of carts, pallets, and trash cans obstructed my path. I pulled the thing down, piece by piece. No longer wondering why Stefan had been so out of breath earlier. At last, I reached the end of the hall, and stared at the door to Stefan's unit. The combination lock opened with a satisfying pop. I only had to try one set of numbers. As the metal door rolled up. A gasp rushed out of me, and I stumbled backward. Four figures sat around a table, still as death, undisturbed by my intrusion. It took a moment to process what I was seeing. As the flashlight's beam moved over the room, fragments of a picture came together in my brain: pale limbs, stiff bodies. Featureless faces. I realized they were mannequins. Four mannequins seated gingerly around a table, awaiting a feast. Plates and silverware had been arranged before each figure, and a bottle of wine stood in the middle. A mixture of dread and curiosity flowed through me, compelling me to enter the room. The mannequins had poseable joints, unlike the ones I'd seen in department stores. An electric sensation arced down my back as I passed by the table. I imagined the creepy things reaching out and grabbing me. I imagined them flaying me and making me their meal. Behind them was a makeshift door, cut into one of the wireframe walls. It seemed that Stefan had connected all five units into some kind of apartment. The next area was a sort of living room. It had a couch, 
a TV stand, and a painting where the television would have sat. I recognized it the moment my flashlight's beam flickered across it. The same painting I'd seen in Clara Norback's Hell House unit. Stefan must have kept it as a souvenir after giving her the boot. Two mannequins were seated on the couch, one of them staring up at the art as if hypnotized by it. The other had its head bowed and hands clasped, sharing a dark prayer with the wicked man in the painting. Goosebumps rippled across my arms as I beheld the scene. What the fuck was Stefan up to in here? Was he part of some insane cult? Was he just a weird loner who spent his time here with his friends? The next room almost made me gag. In it, I found Mr. Klein's horrific mattress, suffused with half a decade of every human stain imaginable. Lying on top of it, in a seductive pose, was a female mannequin in an auburn wig, awaiting the return of her slovenly master. She too was stained. Auburn, I thought, like Liz's hair. The fourth room brimmed with a glut of old furniture, arranged in such a way as to prevent anyone from bothering to pass through it. But at this point, I felt like I knew Stefan better than anyone else in the world, and I knew there was something in that last room I needed to see. I clambered through a fortress of desks and tables and chairs and fell to the floor at the entrance to the fifth room. I'd landed on something plastic, a trash bag or a rain poncho. My light fell upon a glimmering white surface a dozen feet ahead of me. A single red line streaked its height. I followed the trail with the light, stopping at a, a woman's hand. I staggered to my feet, light flailing in my grip. Its beam danced across the ceiling, bouncing off ribbons of blood. Then it fell again on the scene before me, the corpse of a woman sprawled inside a clawfoot tub, her arms draped over its side, as if tossed in a display of sensuality. Even with her head tilted backwards and her chin to the ceiling, her wild hair was unmistakable. It was poor Liz who hadn't replied to my text in days. Several layers of plastic had been wrapped around her form in a hasty attempt to preserve her, or at least to hide the smell. But the blood that smeared every inch of the tub looked new. She had died within a few hours, still wearing my sweatshirt. Everything I'd eaten all day blasted off from my stomach and came rocketing out of my mouth. I ran and threw myself into the tangle of furniture, desperate to wriggle out of the room as fast as I could. A table leg connected with my ribcage and almost knocked me out. My heart thrummed in my ears like a giant wasp. The force of bile against the back of my throat returned. I flew off the stack and hit the ground, running past the praying mannequins. My foot caught one of theirs and pulled it to the floor behind me, my mind interpreting this as one of the things crawling after me. This threw nitro into my terror engines and doubled my speed, and the volume of my girlish shrieks 
until I'd blasted out of the unit and across the entire fifth floor hallway. I didn't wait for the elevator. I took the stairs. A week later, I hung up the phone with the police detective in charge of Stefan's investigation. Liz had been held captive for 48 hours and then suffocated. Her body cavity had been ritually opened and emptied. I'll never forget what he told me next. When the coroner got in there, she found a doll, a plastic baby, like the kind my little girl has. Liz had then been sewn up and redressed. The whole job looked practiced. They wondered if it wasn't Stefan's first time. The ghastly creep himself was nowhere to be found. Police said his home was mostly empty and his car had been abandoned just outside the city limits. It took years for me to be able to walk into dark rooms after that, and years more until I stopped dreaming of Liz and Leo suffering in the dark. I don't know if enough years will ever pass until I can forgive myself for failing both of them. To this day, I still see him in my dreams. The man wreathed in shadow and flame, praying for something wicked. And each time I look out into a crowd, I wonder who among them might someday grant his next wish.